Hello, my name is Lukar Zapatal and in this short video I'd like to talk about how to write a uh, S-Linux policy for your project. This is 2020 edition. Uh, it's a short version of my uh, previous talk which I gave uh, at DEF CON in Brunei in 2015 and in Garvina in 2018. That one was in Czech. Both are online. This one is a short version um and slightly updated version so uh as i said the original uh rather longer talk is uh, available on youtube uh, if you search for how to write a c linux policy for your project painlessly is the title so i'll slightly cover um what a c linux is uh, but the uh, main theme of this short talk is how to write a policy without actually understanding much about SE Linux. Okay, we'll, we'll cover, uh, we'll cover all of it uh, in a kind of a tutorial based, but we'll also deep dive into the process, which is very important. It's not just about hello world example, it's more about the processes and tools and tricks how to do this. What's not included uh, 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 within this presentation is also a Linux administration because there's a lot of content about how to administer C Linux, uh, you know, how to manage processes, how to manage booleans and stuff like that. And because this is well covered uh, on the internet, I'll, I'm focusing on, on, on more of the development side of, uh, of SLinux. Linux. Okay. So in short, SC Linux is a kernel module that enforces a policy. Um, in other words, um, SC Linux can make sure that the processes do follow a set of rules. Now the set of rules can be quite granular um, and, and the subjects are usually processes, Unix or Linux processes. Uh, and, and let's let's just you know sh you know show uh, how this looks like. Uh, this is a picture from uh, a nice coloring book. This is called S Linux Coloring Book, uh, which explains uh, um, S Linux concepts in a very nice way, and it does go beyond what we cover here. But I, I'm I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking these uh, three pictures out of the book. So imagine two uh, animals, cat and dog, and we give them a name. Let's say this is a label, cat and dog. And two, you know, food items. So again, we label them as cat chow and dog chow. And then we have kind of a set of rules that starts with allow and then uh, animal, then the subject, and then, you know, a, a verb, what can be done. Okay, so allow cat to eat cat show food, allow dog to eat dog food. This is essentially how a Linux looks, look, really looks like. These are the rules, they, they literally start with allow. Then we have, we have um, subjects, which are usually uh, uh, processes. Then we have resources, which are usually files, directories, ports, uh, things like that. And then there is a verb, which is usually a syscall, like open file, list directory, stuff like that. And SA Linux isn't really mm, something complicated. It's just a huge list of these allow rules. And that's it. And, in, and then the, the, this rule set can be loaded into a Linux kernel module, and a Linux kernel module makes sure, you know, that the, uh, the process is obeys these rules. So, if cat is, you know, eating cat chow food, that's okay. Linux confirms that. However, 
if there is a, there is a vial, um, if there is a, um, a, a process labeled as dog trying to eat, that's the verb, so let's say it's open file or whatever, cat chow, so there would be, for example, a file labeled as cat chow. SLinux would observe that, and once the rule, once a rule is not found, it would not only uh, create what's called denial audit message or audit log. Uh, if uh, if SLinux is in the mode which is called enforcing, it would actually not allow the process labeled dog uh, to do the action. So it would, instead of uh, file, hand, file handle, it would, the syscall would uh, actually return error. This is very important. Uh, SLinux can prevent from bad things uh, happening. So, you know, misbehavior won't be tolerated. And there is much more than that. This is like a very rough overview of what's, what SLinux can do. Uh, and it is not very practical to, you know, st start and enforce uh, SLinux on all the processes which are running on the system. It would be, <clears throat> this is what, what, what we call a strict mode. Um, by default, uh, SLinux is um, configured to run in targeted mode, which means only several dozens of, you know, uh, processes are enforcing or are running in, uh, we call this confined mode and other processes are not. So things like SSH, daemon, database, and things like that are running in SLinux enforcing mode. And the rest of the system, um, like, for example, user shell or or um, um, some other processes uh, are not running in, uh, in the confined mode. And this is still very useful because, you know, exposed things like uh, HTTPD daemons or proxies or SSH daemons are actually protected by SLinux. Uh, and, that, and then there are uh, a lot more complicated, uh, you know, um, topics like MCS, MLS, and we won't be covering that. And you can do just fine without knowing what uh, these modes and these terms actually mean. <clears throat> So just uh, uh, before we start with the practical, uh, with, with practical things, a little bit uh, about what SC Linux can do for you. Uh, it increases security. This is pretty obvious. So it can prevent from some attacks, not all, but some. Uh, for example, uh, if a process uh, is able or is allowed to read its configuration files and to read and write its uh, data in var lib. Uh, when the process does something different, SNX can uh, audit this and prevent from happening. So uh, I think we, in 2014, 2015, we've, we've seen this shell shock uh, security bug. And this is a typical example of where SNX can help. However, if there is an application which talks to a database using a Unix socket or a TCP socket, and there is a bug in the code that, you know, instead of SQL select, it does, uh, for a crafted uh, request, it does delete, where as Linux, this is not something it can prevent from because that's just a, a data coming from app server, to, um, application server to database server. And so, uh, SLinux can help, but not with everything, of course. However, when, when something bad happens, it can actually restrict investigation in a way that you can tell that uh, an attacker who was on a system, uh, if you, you happen to be in this um, scenario, was not able to actually reach uh, to other systems, uh, which because if there are no ILO rules, it's not, uh, it couldn't happen. So this can actually help a little bit when things happen, when bad things happen. And of course, it's a it's a very good audit as well. It warns you if maybe uh, a script is sniff, trying to sniff around and you know poking, probing systems. 
uh, as Linux in some cases can actually help. Uh, what's less uh, known is that it can find uh, software bugs. Typical examples include unchecked file open uh, return values or leaked descriptors. That's typical. Uh, very often when I was writing policies on our project or uh, or I was trying policies for other projects, uh, programmers do forget ab about simple things like, like when ATC configuration file is not actually readable uh, and you, they tend to forget about this situation when, when let's say permissions are not right. Um, software can just you know seg fault or you know error out because of that and when when, when you follow the s linux writing workflow correctly you will encounter this and will be able to actually fix those bugs and also s linux can be used for to work around proprietary software you know when let's say a, a third party software you don't have a source code for sniffs around a uh, system and things like that so you can actually block this okay um i'll be using fedora for uh, a couple of other for the rest of the presentation but this applies to any distribution that has s linux turned on so s linux is l uh, is distributed in s linux policy packages uh, and what you want to, what, what's usually installed by default is S Linux policy targeted. As I said, the targeted mode is um, um, more when S Linux protects only specific set of uh, uh, so, um, software or, or packages. Um, you want to install a devil sub, sub package as well, which contains um, uh, also development files. The, the policy itself contains basically a lot of what's called modules. Module. These are files which end uh, with PP. Um, this is coming from Fedora, I think, 18 or 19. Um, oh, actually 20. Yeah. Um, things change a bit, little bit, a little bit. Um, we now have a what's called CAIL. And I'm not sure if, uh, but in the modern uh, Fedora uh, or even RHEL 8, uh, policies now are distributed in uh, CIL files. Uh, but the overall goal is the same. You know, you have a, a module that you load in and it contains the rules. So it's a technical change. Devil sub package contains some ment pages, HTML pages. It does contain a very important make file, so you don't need to write your own. And it contains interfaces and SPT files. I'll explain that in a minute. There are a couple of other tools you wish to install, like uh, Policy Core Utils Python is one of, um, of the most important ones from this slide. SE tools as well. And once installed, uh, I suggest to run the sepolgen-ifgen. It's a little bit complicated name, um, but what it does, it creates um, a helper files which allows the, some tools to um, resolve macros. And I'll show this later. Uh, Chances are this is automatically executed when you install a package in modern version uh, of Fedora, but you can't go wrong if you run this command. So anatomy if, uh, of, of policy. Um, so basically what you need to do is you, you need to create a three files, TE, IF and FC. Uh, these th three files must exist. Uh, you know, you can't just Go with TE. Although, if in some cases you will only need TE file and uh, IF and FC will be empty, that's possible. However, I think the make file uh, which uh, you will use assumes these three files do uh, exist. So you need to 
create them all. And the only line you need to do right is policy underscore module name of the policy and the version. This must be in the TE file. To compile a policy, the best thing you can do is to use the make file. So you just do make dash F and the path to the make file. You can create a simling if you are, if you like. You can even copy the make file, it doesn't change quite often. Or you can create your own make file which calls a make file. That's also an option if you if you like. And then once the policy is loaded, sorry, once you once you once you execute make, you can load a policy. There's actually a, a target in the make file that loads your policy, but just for sake of um, trying things out to load a policy, and uh, the command to execute is se module dash i, like in insert or yeah, that's insert probably. And the pp file that which was created and to list uh, all available policies or loaded policies sg module dash l you'll see a lot of policies there uh, by default a lot, a lot of modules like ssh and stuff like that and one of these should be your policy and this policy does actually you can do this it will do nothing it will load up and it does nothing but you can have it loaded so um, what are the make file targets? Uh, by default, uh, it compiles, it generates some documentation files and it loads the policy by, by default. So actually the, the SE module uh, dash I was unnecessary. It was already loaded up. Uh, there's also reload uh, target, which reloads if it was previously loaded. There's refresh, which reloads all the policies, not just the uh, one you have um, you are working on, and clean, um, you know, cleans the working directory. A couple of environment directory uh, environment variables, which are by default set to same uh, defaults. Uh, name represents uh, uh, policy. Uh, uh, mode targeted is the one we want to use usually type again stand standard uh, is the one that we want to use if you remember mls mcs uh, are those special types or modes we won't be diving into and why helps with verbose output as you can see um, as you will see actually um, um, that there will be a lot of uh, all our rules you know, hundreds, hundreds, and thousands of allow rules. And to be able to eff efficiently work with these, macro processor is used, M4 uh, is used for writing SC-Links policies. So here's, a, a, here's a, an example uh, SC-Links policy. And my advice on if you want to start writing your own policy for your own project, is that you copy this uh, from um, any kind of hello world example you find on the internet it all starts with policy module your uh, policy name and version the version is really informative it doesn't uh, do anything as far as i know it will show up if you do se module dash l to list uh, list uh, module um, policy uh, modules then typical SLinux policy is uh, written for a daemon that starts up uh, or for for executable. So for, exec for executable, you want to define a uh, type. Uh, type as, uh, if you remember, uh, we had cat and dog and they had labels cat and dog. So this is essentially the, the exact uh, thing, the, the exact same thing. Um, every line in SLinux uh, must end with semicolon. And you'll see a um, couple of lines which don't. I'll explain that later. So type, and then that's the keyword, uh, name of the type. 
in our case it will be my app underscore t it is um, quite common to end uh, all types with underscore t so type my app t is the what we call a domain that's the type a process is labeled with and it will be used quite often in the in the policy now to for a process to be able to to be labeled or to to enter a, a domain a special type must be uh, created which is uh, in this case called my exact and this one will be only used to label a file the executable which is executed so usually uh, user share my app will be labeled using my app exact excuse me <coughs> now now the third line domain type my app says essentially um this is actually a domain this type is domain so it, um and uh, as you can see this line does not end with semicolon that's because this is actually a macro this is m4 macro which re resolves which expands to some other SLinux statements so here's a tip every time you use macro uh, in a policy you must not uh, put a semicolon in the end if you do you'll get error and those errors are not very friendly so just always make sure you 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 know if that's a that's a m2 macro or not uh, here's a, a tip if the line starts with type or allow it's a SLinux statement if it doesn't start with these two keywords it is probably a macro it is macro there are a couple of other statements but you know you mostly encountered 95 percent uh, with those two type or allow um, and then we create the two additional um, types my app log t and my app tmpt so these will be used to tag to label files and directories in this case probably var log and var tmp or slash tmp something the goal of the policy usually is, uh, you know, uh, when when uh, when a, a daemon or a executable runs in in uh, confined mode, all the operation, all the syscalls must be must have allow rules. So uh, it is not possible to write a uh, 50 or 60 or only 90 percent of the allow rules because the the application would ultimately error out would ultimately would be blocked and would be probably closed so for every single directory or file the application needs to read or write or list there must be a rule in this case you know it will be only log file and tmp file there are two macros logging log file and files tmp file which actually again marks those log files uh, uh, sorry log types or tmp types uh, as as a, a log file type or tmp file doc and then we have a set of allow rules if you remember the coloring book uh, it starts with allow then we have a subject that's the my app t that's the type of the application which is, which is also known as a domain then uh, we have a, we have a, a resource so again this is a type there's a special thing a colon and and what kind of the of the, of a resource is that so my app block t colon file so we want to say we only want because this uh, this type can be applied both to directories or for and files so in this case we specify we only want files and then uh, verbs or verbs these are 
um, you know, ac actions. These are often often um, represented as strings, which re which are counterparts to syscalls or uh, or set sets of syscalls. In this case, read file permissions is uh, a list of um, file uh, syscalls which uh, are needed to read a file or to append to a file. The second one is allow my apt my apt file manage file permissions. This is again a list of permissions, and I'll explain uh, uh, you later how to you know actually see the list of all the syscalls which are included in this list to actually manage files. So that includes read, list, write, truncate, things like that. And then the last line is, um, so these two lines were statement, so semicolon in the end of the lines. And then the last one is again macro, files TMP file trans, my empty, my empty, empty uh, and file. This is actually a macro that expands to one or more allow rules, so statements. Essentially what it does is It's a transition, file transition. It says when an application, which is running in my apt domain, creates a file in a, a directory which is labeled my apt mpt, give it the very same uh, 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 type as well. And don't worry, this is just an overview of you know a policy how it looks like. I'll guide you through how to, you know, find those and understand those uh, macros in more detail. The IF file stands for interface. Is a file when is a file that usually you don't need to actually use for your if you if you have a uh, a project uh, you write up a Linux policy for a project and you don't expect other projects or components of a system integrate with your policy um, usually you don't need to write those interfaces if you however expect let's say you write um, I don't know um, you write a um, database server and you expect other processes very often to create uh, allow rules to let's say connect to your uh, port what you want to uh, do is to create um, an interface or a micro micro this is a, a syntax m4 syntax how to create a macro then you you create it here so other other uh, Linux policies can actually use this macro to simplify their policies. The syntax is a little bit weird if you don't know uh, how M4 looks like. Uh, it is really a backtick and single quote. That's the syntax. And we don't go into details uh, about how to write your own macros. Just um, it is pretty obvious. Um, it is it is important to understand how this uh, looks. So, as you can see, interface uh, is the keyword and uh, name of the macro. Every time you use uh, a type for the first time, you need to actually require it. And gen require is a macro that ge generates this require st statement, and then macro call, call can also be you know macros can be nested so there's macro and my app dom trans dom trans that you know uh, uses dom trans pattern which is another macro which ultimately expands to some statements uh, so for example these the second one the my app lock uh, read log 
ultimately expands to allow rule and to a few other allow rules which uh, which will be provided by the logging search logs and uh, the dollar one is the first argument of the macro again you don't need to rewrite these to be able to successfully create a, a policy uh, but you need to understand and to be able to read those macros because uh, you'll, you'll, you'll sometimes need to see what a macro does and finally, finally the third file FC is file stands for file context and this is three column uh, configuration file the first column is actually a uh, regular expression. This is not a glob, it is a regular expression. The second column is either dash dash, which stands for files, or dash d stands for directories. There are a couple of other uh, options here, which you can find in the man page, but usually you, you want these two. And th this actually, this file actually tells SLinux uh, which files or directories are supposed to have uh, what, which, which uh, types. So in this case, user has been my app should have uh, my app exact and the other one log t. And when you uh, load a module into a Linux, S Linux makes sure that every time uh, a S Linux policy. Um, Every time a user calls a, a command, which is uh, called uh, restore con um, on files or directories or even root folder, uh, SLinux will correct those two types. And in order to be able to actually uh, do the initial transition from my app XXT to my app T, you actually need uh, the my app binary in the user has been to have this label so it is important to not only load up a policy but to also restore file contexts correctly when an uh, application is installed from rpm uh, rpm will automatically set those uh, linux uh, policies uh, labels uh, by default. However, if you copy those files from um, or you, if you build your own application or whatever, you need to restore or in, initially set uh, using an, uh, an, a special command. Now, with the, as I've said, with the policy dash devil sub package, you'll find a lot of IF files, and these are the macros which can be used uh, within your policies so you don't need to write a lot of allow rules um, there's special naming convention uh, for example uh, in the files if you'll find a lot of rules which uh, sorry a lot of a lot of uh, interfaces or should I say macros uh, which has something to do with files and directories. This one is very often quite useful. Core network is also quite useful when dealing with um, networking. And then there's a lot of uh, demons or services uh, based names, Apache, ABRT, SSH, stuff like that. So, so every time you want to talk to, let's say, ABRT daemon, you just go into this interface and you'll find macro that helps you with that. There are also, so there's like almost 500 IF files and a couple of SPT files, you know, less than a dozen. And those SPT files, which are called support files, defines those helper patterns, patterns. Usually, the file patterns is the most important one. Um, that was the um, manage uh, uh, log files pattern in the previous example, I think. 
Unfortunately, because M4 micro preprocessor expands and the your ultimate policy will have usually thousands of lines, uh, it is sometimes the errors are sometimes a little bit off. So it says like you have error on line 10,000 something and and in order to actually see the line you need to go to a tmp and then a policy name the tmp file and see you know what kind of macro was expanded there luckily asinux uh, leaves uh, comments for each individual uh, line in your on your original policy uh, it gives you uh, uh, a comment there so if you can uh, here you can see an example so uh, you'll you'll uh, you'll understand uh, when you when you when you uh, open up the file but I have to say um, it's a little bit rough when you start with uh, Linux writing policies. When you forget a colon, a semicolon, or something, and you're not sure, and a policy is not compiling. Uh, very often, what you do is, I suggest you to write in short bursts, few lines, and then compile, few lines, and compile. So every time, if you encounter a syntax error, you just delete few lines, and then you can. <laughs> Try by using try line error, you can isolate the line that is um, that doesn't work, and then you can either ask or you can either go here into this TMP file and find this line to see actually what it expands to. As I've said, semicolon only when you start with allow or type. SNOX has a very limited set of uh, statements or keywords, so it's just one of the few. And if it doesn't, if it not start, doesn't start with that, yeah, don't use a semicolon. You actually must not use the semicolon, otherwise you'll get a syntax error. Naming of these um, uh, macros, there's a there's a syntax naming um, naming convention behind this, and ninety k percent the naming convention is um, name of the interface file that's files underscore that's the first part and then verb what to do like read and then what user files uh, that's the that's the resource so you can actually after some time you'll be able to write those uh, macros uh, by by hand uh, sorry you know off your off your head again this is example from files uh, uh, if so you can tell that this actually this macro if you write files user files read user files should give you a set of rules which actually allows a process or domain to read user Files and user files, obviously, as you'd expect, is uh, are files which are under you know, slash user. Here's a, an example from SPT support file. And syntax is a little bit different, but uh, what it does is list their perms. These are the syscalls you you need to do, perform in order to list the directory. And because there are many syscalls, that's why a lot of actions, a lot of macros, a lot of allow rules uses these SPT helpers. Uh, here, file patterns SPT uh, defines a helper. Um, again, this is a macro. It also expands to allow rules. And the naming convention here is a little bit different. There's no file patterns prefix. The pattern is actually in the in the end. 
as you can see you know you'll need to do a lot of re research and reading of the if files in order to find those interfaces luckily there are tools to do that there are several things i'll show you how you can do this first of all i highly recommend this very nice book called s linux cookbook by sven remulen if i pronounced that correctly and there, there's a super nice trick he uh, shows in the in the book uh, he actually created a set of shell functions which you can include in your shell and it helps you uh, to find in the interfaces and in the definitions and support files and you can actually find those uh, he made this available free on github so he is a, he is an example of se show if and then uh, name of macro and it will automatically show you the macro you know whole macro so you can understand what it what it does the same is uh, for uh, spt files so se show dev you use this macro uh, sorry the, this alias or shell function if you know what you're looking for if you don't know what you're looking for then there is se find if so let's say my application needs to do some logging and I'm not really sure about logging so I would do as if I if logging just logging and it would show me all the uh, interfaces or all, all, all the macros or support macros from my uh, whole as Linux installation so this way I, I would I would be able to you know browse through these and you know then using se show I have to see the macro and to find the macro another tip uh, this one is mine is how to navigate through use using C tags so um, I use a VI editor a lot of Vim actually and it has a capability uh, and this applies to pretty much all good uh, text editors uh, it uh, has a C tag support and although CTEX uh, does not have native support for parsing uh, SLinux uh, policies, M4 and SLinux syntax, there is, it's very, very uh, extensible. So there is a way of um, defining, uh, defining uh, reg regular expressions, uh, which gives you, it doesn't work 100%, but you know gives you very nice uh, very nice results so basically uh, run this uh, shell and we would create a tags file and then use the tags file to navigate uh, in the code base so you can easily uh, go to definition and things like that I made this available uh, on github lzap slash vim linux uh, I think there are some macros for Vim and things like that. I don't remember, uh, but yeah, you can just do just fine with the with Sven's macros. Oh, sorry, Sven's uh, shell aliases or functions, um, and maybe C tags as well. Unfortunately, not many editors do support S Linux policies at all. What I recommend yeah, at least if your editor supports M4, M4 is widely used in autoconf, automatic autoconf. So it's very likely that your editor do have M4 support syntax highlighting that would give you at least some syntax highlighting. It's not perfect. It would ignore those LO type and other keywords, but um, it's a good start. When S Linux sees a violation of it, its its rule set, it would write uh, what's called S Linux denial. You will find those in audit log, var log, audit audit log, and you're searching for AVC keyword. AVC. There's a tool called O A U search audit search. So you you can either grab or using A A U search uh, AVC to see see denial and denial is very 
uh, very important to understand. So you, you'll see that, uh, let's investigate the Nenial, the first one. Name bind is the action. That's usually a syscall that failed. Then we see ru uh, uh, PID of the process, uh, process name Ruby. We see uh, we see uh, source context. That's s context. That's the actually uh, domain uh, or type associated with the process. I didn't tell you about system U, system R, and s zero. You can just ignore these are user role and uh, and uh, s zero is for multi level uh, security. Uh, we Basically, by default, these are not used in the default as a Linux mode, so you can just ignore these and just focus on the on the middle part, which is Passenger T in this case. So as you can tell, it, it is Ruby process running in Passenger domain. T context is target context, so the resource it was trying to, in this case, bind. It was unreserved port T, so it was some uh, some uh, port in this case it was UDP port because that the last one is class of the of the resource or you can say type of the resource in this case it was UDP socket so I can tell that uh, this was a Ruby process running with pit one one two eight two eight running in passenger domain and it was trying to bind a UDP pocket uh, socket and the port was actually unreserved. What's, what, what it means is every single port in, in a system is either labeled, so it has a name. Again, ports are just like files or directories and processes. They can be labeled, so they can have a label. And then it's there. there is a special type, which is called unreserved port D. Uh, if port is not labeled, it falls into this category. Now a lot of these audit uh, denials has just enough information that you can automatically create rules out of it. There's a, a nice tool called audit to allow. And if you run this, uh, if you run this without any command, you can copy and paste audit and hit control D or you know, end of stream. And it would generate you, uh, generate you uh, or the um, rules. So if you you can copy this paste from Bugzilla for issue tracker easily, audit to allow, hit enter, copy paste, control D, and it would generate you a rule. If you do AL, that actually uh, says uh, generate me rules for all the denials. Which have been which which were seen from the last policy reload. So usually you reload a policy, you do something with your software, and then you do audit to allow AL, and it would show you uh, all the rules which are actually missing. And you can do this in either enforcing mode or permissive mode. Uh, SLinux can be turned on in three modes. Per enforcing is the obvious one. Permissive is that SLinux is still running. It's still checking all the rules, but if there is a rule denial, it would audit uh, or it would log this into audit, uh, but it would not prevent the software from doing the, that action. And disabled is the uh, mode you don't want to use actually. If you do RIL, this actually, if you remember the command uh, SE. Poll again if uh, again if the interface reverse interfaces mm, meta data is generated it would actually if there is a reasonable macro it would actually show you the macro in this case instead of allow passenger under reserve port the UDP pocket name bind it will actually give you a macro in this case coordinate UDP bind generate port. Which is much more readable 
And in this case, this macro is kind of a too generic, but, uh, but if this would be, let's say, reading reading an ATC file, it would uh, give you a very reasonable uh, uh, ATC read files macro. And finally, you can actually uh, use M, capital M uh, option. And in this case, audit to allow will not only create create you those rules, it would create you a whole new module. You can name it in this case quick fix. And you can and it would also compile it. So you can just reload it up straight straight up. So this is good for uh, for uh, workarounds. Now I know it's very attempting to just okay that's that's what all i need to know i just you know create this hello world uh, first uh, four lines and then use audit to allow to write a policy that's actually not good that's actually not what you want to do uh, because uh, first if you don't have your file context correct it would uh, actually generate you uh, very incorrect uh, SUNX uh, allow rules. In the last command, let me go back. Here, um, uh, the passenger Ruby process is trying to bind the UDP port. So the rule would be allow this process to bind any UDP generic port, so any of the unreserved port D. That's actually a very rough rule. What you want actually to do is to find which port number it is trying to bind in this case this was um, dns and in no make label the port i think this udp 53 i i if i remember correctly make name you know create a label for this port and then create a different rule allow to passenger only to bind the, to the dns uh, label Okay, I'm making this up. This one actually, uh, this one was actually response uh, to UDP. Uh, it was actually generic port rule, but uh, you know, you know uh, uh, the context. Okay, so don't just blindly uh, use audit to allow. You can use this. It's a nice tool um, when you know what you're doing. But if you don't understand the rule, never ever add it to your policy because you can be doing it wrong. Again, domain transition. If you don't have a domain transition right, for example, your um, your process spawns another process, and then another process does something. Let's say, try tries to mount tries to mount a file system. You can easily end up with a lot of rules, which. Uh, if if uh, there was a no n not transition, uh, you could easily do this uh, using a single macro. Let's say instead of giving your your uh, process to do to do a lot of uh, um, syscalls, uh, which has something to do with mounting systems, file systems, you would uh, add a macro that uh, would allow running mount command, right? Something like that. Uh, also, uh, and I've encountered this several times, uh, there was a very strange behavior that our software was opening a file or opening a socket or something, and I couldn't find a reason why it was happening. So I, I um, asked the developer owner of the component, and we actually found that the software is, you know, opening up a port that it shouldn't be opening, or it was reading something that, you know, was not necessary. So actually, it's very often uh, better to fix uh, the software itself and not to, uh, to add the rule. And also, audit to allow can also sometimes uh, lead to allowing your software too much. Maybe. Uh, Maybe you have a misconfiguration and it shouldn't be reading uh, slash data um, folder. It's just because you have configured this way uh, it was 
and uh, that would lead to a rule that shouldn't be there. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember that SLX policy writing is it's not about the policy itself and the artifact. It's also about the process. You can find uh, various design issues, misconfiguration of bugs, and so it is important to pay attention. And if you don't understand uh, those rules, uh, go and ask or investigate the source code. My one of my uh, last advice is do small steps. Do to do small policy change, add one line, a few rules, compile, test it, and then repeat. Um, and if you're, when you've finished writing your policy and you're getting bug reports, always, please always uh, make every, for every single small change or bug, make a, a separate commit, explain uh, what's going on, and also include the denial in the commit uh, is very important because I can assure you that eight years after when you'll be investigating um, something or when you won't remember why the rule is there uh, not only the description but also the whole denial can help a lot because maybe you can find that it was probably not good uh, rule or there was a bug in the software itself and that's all i have today uh, hopefully it was short enough and thanks for watching drop me a comment down below if you have comments corrections or if you just finished uh, watching the video i'd like to know